so good morning. I think most of the people in this room um, know me, but in case you don't, I'm Jeff Marbach. I'm one of the Interventional uh, Cardiology Fellows, and I was previously a cardiology resident here for the last few years. Um, today I'm going to take some time to talk about um, focused cardiac ultrasound and, and really bedside cardiac diagnosis, kind of where we came from and, and where I think things are going to kind of head over the next decade or, and more into the future. Um, now, I know oftentimes when we think about focused cardiac ultrasound, you know, people often want to kind of pit it against the stethoscope and the physical examination techniques. Um, and, you know, I'm not really sure why this is, but um, some people from the Heart Institute might have something to say about that. Um, you know, hopefully by the end of this talk, I can kind of convince you that that's not the way that I see things. And, and I don't really think that's the way that we should really look at things. I think we should see, you know, bedside ultrasound as a tool that we can really incorporate into our daily practice. Um, so I'm going to start by just very briefly talking about kind of how we evaluate patients, how we've been doing it for the last few hundred years, um, where this all started, um, when it actually started to change, and when we started to step away from the bedside and started to spend more time away from patients. Um, and then we're going to kind of look at how things have maybe shifted with, with some of the technological advances that we've come to uh, have access to over the last you know, 10 years or so. So how do we evaluate cardiac disease. So, you know, this is something we're all quite familiar with. So we see patients in the clinic, in the emergency department, we ask them some questions. Um, maybe we get some vital signs, maybe the nurse does that. Um, we look at the patients. If you're Dr. Golion in arrhythmia clinic, this is probably where things stop. Um, and then you refer them for an ablation. Um, for many of us though, then we'll perform some physical examination maneuvers. Maybe we'll auscultate. Um, and then that clinical encounter tends to end with either us sending the patient on their way, ordering a medication, or perhaps ordering further diagnostic tests. Now, where did this begin? So does anybody know who this is? So this guy is Leopold Auenbrugger. Now I have to warn you, that's probably one of several European names I'm gonna struggle to pronounce today. Um, but he's really the guy that probably deserves the most credit for the foundation of the clinical exam, or else at least the beginning of the modern clinical examination as we know it. Um, he was the guy that um, first described the technique of percussion. Okay? Now, this is a story that probably a lot of us have heard throughout our careers, but as the story goes, his father, who was an innkeeper, used to tap on the side of barrels of, of wine casks in order to determine how full they were, and he really implemented this technique into caring for patients. Um, and he first described this in his um, paper, Inventum uh, Novum. Now, obviously this, you know, especially these days, this doesn't sound like that important of a, of a discovery. But at that time, you got to remember that the way medicine was practiced, people were following the theories of Hippocrates and, and Galen, and, and really we were talking about the four humors of, of the body, and these being the things that um, were responsible for, for causing disease and for maintaining health. So you had phlegm, blood, yellow bile, and black bile. And, and that's really um, the, the theory that this technique of percussion really was developed under. There was no kind of understanding of physiology and anatomy wasn't all that important at that point in time. So um, it, it really took a while, though he had described this in the late 1700s, it took quite a while for this technique actually to, to catch on. Um, it wasn't until this gentleman, um, Jean Nicolas Corvissar, I think I'm saying that okay, um, who was a French physician, basically came upon a copy of um, Leopold's paper and began to incorporate this into the way that he um, would examine and assess patients. Now, he was actually Napoleon's personal physician, so um, he had, uh, I guess, a lot of authority in this area, and people were, were kind of happy to um, listen to the things he said. So he did this for about 30 years. He would pass it along to his disciples and his students. Um, and it was about 30 years later when he actually published his findings. And what he did is he actually republished Napoleon's Inventum Novum um, with extensive commentary and translated it from Latin into um, French. And 
This then kind of gave rise to or was a significant part of the uh, French school of medical thought and, and this is where medicine was really beginning to change kind of in the hospitals throughout um, Paris. This is when we started to see away with the idea of the four humors and those different theories of how disease was, was caused and we started to see physicians as, as really these perceivers of pathophysiological signs. Now, this kind of took a giant step forward um, when this gentleman, anybody know who this is? So this is René Lanec. So he's the one that was um, actually responsible for inventing the, the stethoscope. Um, he was a student of Corvassar's, and you know, he, he's another one that has a, an, an interesting story. Apparently he had a, a moment of revelation when he didn't want to place his uh, ear upon the chest of a female patient in order to listen to her, so he decided to roll up a piece of paper into a cone. He put the pointy part in his ear and the base on the, on the chest, and he was uh, apparently astounded by what he had heard, and this kind of gave rise to the, to the first stethoscope. He went on to develop these and, and, and make wooden stethoscopes, and he published his findings in, um, in his uh, paper or his book, I guess you would say, La Auscultation. Um, and apparently when he first started to publish this, he would actually give a handmade stethoscope to everyone who bought a copy of his book. So you know, he kind of ensured the success of the stethoscope by giving away um, free stethoscopes to people that would, uh, would read his book. Um, in that book, we actually see some of the first um, descriptions of terms that we still use today, like Rawls or Rails, depending what side of the Canadian-American border you're on, um, egophony, pectoral equi. Um, and, you know, it, it was felt that this was important. It's, he, there's a funny quote that he has where he says, it, uh, it alleviated the antipathy of close physical contact between doctor and patient by placing an instrument between them. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so, then things kind of continued to... Uh, move forward, um, and there was a shift um, for some of the advances in medicine from the hospitals of Paris to the universities of, of Germany. And this uh, was the time in the kind of early 1800s still when we began to see uh, the concept of, of bringing chemistry and physiology into medicine. And, and we really now for sure see the ideas of Hippoc Hippocrates and Gallen being kind of discarded and the Western idea of medicine um, focused on physiology, pathology, and anatomy really started to, to rise. And, and with this, we see that there was um, a huge uh, a, f a huge amount of advance in the physical examination, okay? Um, now, if we look forward, we can see that, you know, beyond the stethoscope, there was a, a ton of different medical instruments that kind of came into existence, were invented, were, were discovered around the 1800s, okay? And these instruments were hugely important for the way that the physical examination kind of developed throughout that time. And it also created a, a huge shift in the way that the patient-physician uh, relationship would, would go on. You know, up until the point of the physical examination, really, physicians would sit at the bedside, we'd listen to the history, we'd try to make sense of everything that the patient had to say. But as we introduced more instruments and more objective signs into our clinical examination, we really started to do away with some of the importance of the, the patient's history. So some of the important um, inventions throughout that time were the ophthalmoscope, which um, was invented in 1850. The concept of medical um, thermometry was kind of came into play in 1870s. Um, before that, you know, the idea of human temperature was just something that you would feel. It was a qualitative sign, you know, hot, cold, warm. Um, but now it was something that we could objectively quantify on a numerical scale. Um, we kind of repurposed the hammer as something that we use for percussion and building into something we could use for discovering um, or, or testing reflexes. And then really in 1896 was the time that the sphygmomanometer was discovered and this basically represents the last part of the qualitative signs of the physical examination or, or qualitative signs, you know, vital signs that we use in, in 
clinical examination. And, and that basically hasn't really changed to this day. Are we frozen? There we go. Um, now, as I mentioned, there was, you know, increasing emphasis on physical exam findings, objective findings, and less emphasis on, on history. And, and I think this is uh, quite a good quote from the president of the Royal Medical Society of Edinburgh in 1883 when he said, in trying to um, describe um, obtaining a history from a patient, the more serious symptoms are often lightly touched upon, the more trivial exaggerated, and the whole jumbled together without logical sequence or the slightest attempt at orderly arrangement. During the tedious narration, it may give the physician patience to bear in mind that from it, he must obtain the right end of the clue, which is to guide him in the difficult task of ascertaining the nature, extent, and seat of the disease. So, although, you know, he and his colleagues, they still did think that the, the clinical history from the patient was important, they really began to believe this concept that there was two histories. There was the history that you got from the patient, which was oftentimes difficult to interpret, and possibly vague, and then there was the second history that you could get from the objective examination findings. Um, now, that led to a huge change and, and huge advances in physical exam findings kind of throughout the 19th century, um, and the idea of what a physician was really kind of shifted throughout this time. You know, now physicians were able to look at patients and tell them things that were going on in their bodies that they didn't even know existed, you know? So people were pretty impressed with physicians as diagnosticians, you know? They could listen to heart murmurs, test reflexes, look at retinal vasculature, and, and basically tell patients much more about themselves than they even knew. So, you know, this concept of the physician really kind of evolved, you know, from this compassionate soul sitting at the bedside to, you know, what we see in modern television with the idea of the diagnostician who's, you know, perhaps callous and, and doesn't really actually believe in talking to patients at all. Um, but at the end of this, you know, 200 years of advances in physical examination really kind of led us to these four pillars, right? So inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And that's essentially where we are today, and that hasn't changed a whole lot since that time. And there's not a lot of technological advances um, within that realm. You know, we have fancier looking stethoscopes, we can record heart sounds, but that's kind of the, the most exciting thing that's happened. Now, what also happened throughout this time is physicians began to actually pull away even further from patients. So, you know, instead of, you know, paying less attention to listening to them, there were actually a lot of changes that happened in the 19th and, and early 20th century that pulled physicians even further away from the bedside. And this really kind of began with diagnostic laboratories. So it was in the late 1800s when the first diagnostic laboratory, specifically for clinical purposes, um, was, was developed, and that was in Munich. And it was soon followed by laboratories kind of all across the United States. And, you know, prior to this time, scientific laboratories existed, but really they were just about scientific inquiry. They didn't have um, goals towards diagnostic um, purposes. Now, that was actually soon followed by bedside diagnostic um, laboratories, or sorry, wardside diagnostic laboratories, which, you know, led physicians, again, away from the bedside and into the lab on the ward where they had some reagents they could use and they could do some simple testing. Um, this further kind of pulled us away once we got the idea, or, or sorry, once we discovered um, x-rays. You know, so now, rather than just kind of hearing and, and listening, seeing what's going on on the outside of a patient, we actually physically had the ability to peer into a patient to see, you know, what was inside them. And this led to a value um, from physicians predominantly um, where vision became far more important than, you know, what they heard from a history um, or from what they could kind of palpate on an exam. Um, and I think that makes sense, you know, obviously a chest x-ray is going to be able to localize um, a pericardial effusion or sorry, or, or even a pleural effusion much better than percussion and auscultation ever could. So this continued to advance and we got, you know, really amazing um, 
technological advances kind of over the next 50 years. You know, with um, ECGs, we can see what's going on in the electrical activity of the heart. With MRIs, we can see um, how the hydrogen atoms respond to a magnetic field. Um, and, and really, this has enabled us to have extremely good um, anatomical detail in assessing patients. Now, again, all of these technologies created a spatial separation between the patient and the physician. Um, and it wasn't just a spatial separation, it now too was a temporal separation as, you know, prior to this, diagnosis had to be kind of made at the time of evaluating the patient at the bedside, but now, you know, these tests were done at a later date, they could be interpreted um, at a later time, and with digital technology, we could share these images, you know, they could be seen from across the world, um, and they can um, uh, be shared with other physicians to get second opinions and, and the latter. Now, each of these incremental advances in remote diagnosis, again, as I mentioned, pulled us further away from the patient. And then ultimately, um, what we're left with is um, EPIC. So despite all of the, the struggles that maybe some of us have with EPIC, obviously it's pretty amazing that these days we can sit at home, we can order tests, we can look at vital signs, we can interpret tests, we can order medications and procedures without ever having to see the patient. I think some of the surgical residents probably are familiar with that. Um, now, now, as I've mentioned, the vast majority of these technologies have really kind of pulled us away um, from, from the patients, but there is one technology that with the advances that we've seen over time has actually kind of started to lead us back to the bedside and, and to spend more time with the patient, and that's ultrasound. So, you know, ultrasonography, when it began, um, it was really kind of first used in a clinical context in the 1940s to, um, to attempt to diagnose intracranial malignancies, and what we started with was machines like that, which were, you know, quite large and bulky and dedicated laboratories that looked much like where we keep MRI and CT scanners these days. Um, over time, things shrunk down, and as we gained portability from ultrasound, we began incorporating ultrasound into many aspects of clinical care. So, you know, the concept or the idea of the fast scan in assessing trauma patients has been around as, late, as early as the 1970s. It was incorporated into guidelines by the kind of mid to late 1990s. Um, so it's been a long time that we've been using this portable technology to kind of assess patients um, at the bedside. You know, in the early 2000s and, and late 1990s, it really became standard of care that if we're doing invasive bedside procedures, we really should be using um, ultrasound to guide those procedures. You know, there's been all kinds of studies that have demonstrated that we get fewer complications when we use ultrasound guidance. And, and really, at this point in time, it's not really acceptable to place central lines without ultrasound guidance. So it's been a pretty steady trend to increasing utilization. Now, probably the most important trends that we've seen in, in ultrasound technology, and certainly the things that we appreciate on a daily basis, are the more recent trends that have really taken this idea of portability and kind of maximized that to the point where now we have handheld units. And, you know, this is really due to a lot of um, innovation over the last decade. You know, increasing computing power has allowed us to basically um, store much of this information in the cloud or, or on small devices. We've been able to develop high resolution screens in a small format that give us images that we can actually use for interpretation. And then there's been a lot of development in terms of the, the type and size of ultrasound components that have um, enabled the transducers and, and everything that is needed to do the image um, acquisition uh, fit into a much smaller package. And today, really, what we're kind of left with is, uh, you know, a variety of different machines from different manufacturers that can um, kind of provide us with any, num any, new, sorry, any number of um, clinical um, capabilities in terms of um, obtaining bedside imaging. So with this came the idea of the focused cardiac ultrasound. Now, the reason behind this, or kind of the idea behind this, was that, you know, if we have this imaging capability, Obviously, we don't have all of the features of a standard echocardiogram machine. Most of these machines are limited in several, at least some ways, um, compared to standard large machines. 
but we do have the ability to obtain some information from a, a cardiac evaluation. So people started to incorporate the idea of a focused cardiac examination into their bedside clinical assessment. So now, like I, like I mentioned, when I say that, what I'm talking about is using ultrasound as a bedside clinical tool to help with your diagnostic and your diagnosis and your management of these patients. So we're not talking about replacing formal echocardiogram studies to evaluate whether aortic stenosis is severe or moderate and assess gradients, at least not at this time. And we're not talking about a limited echocardiogram, which really is only limited by the number of images that we take. Um, we're just talking about a, a quick bedside assessment. Now, there's guidelines from a variety of different societies, from critical care to emergency medicine to the American Society of Echocardiography, that have kind of different recommendations as to what exactly a focused cardiac assessment entails. But you know, it's in general, it's pretty much agreed upon um, that it can be used for assessing whether or not there's a pericardial effusion, qualitative assessment of left ventricular function and then kind of basic evaluation of valvular structure and function, um, particularly using kind of limited color Doppler, which most of the portable devices these days have. Now, I know when I kind of bring this up, obviously we've all kind of been burned in the past by, by some of the things that we've seen um, and, and some of the phone calls that we've gotten. You know, I think we worry about, you know, can we trust the information that, that I'm getting from this? Because either, you know, we're worried about were the images adequate to, to really give me that information? Was the person performing and interpreting those images trained and skilled enough to, to do that? You know, I, these are just a few of the things that I've um, kind of experienced over my few years here. But you know, the POCUS looked fine when you find out that a patient has an EF of 20%. Um, there's a large pericardial, pericardial effusion. When I go on to find out that the patient has a very large right ventricle and a pulmonary embolism. And then there's diastolic dysfunction on the POCUS, which I'm honestly still not sure how the emergency docs figure out. Um, but anyways, um, when, uh, you know, I, when I look at this and when I think about, you know, can I trust this information, the way I try to interpret it is, you know, okay, well, how does this information compare to the alternative? You know, which, I at least right now, the alternative is, our bedside assessment, so clinical examination, patient history, and you know maybe limited um, laboratory testing. So if we look, you know, there's been lots of studies looking at the accuracy of historical and physical examination findings in assessing patients. This is just one example, but this is an example of um, a meta-analysis done looking at the reliability of physical examination findings, clinical history findings, and some bedside laboratory findings um, to diagnose acute heart failure in the emergency department. So if we take a look at this, we can see that, you know, something like orthopnea, which we're kind of taught as a classical symptom of decompensated heart failure, has a sensitivity of about 52%. Um, PND sensitivity about 46%. Now obviously the specificity of these tests is, is much higher than that, but really oftentimes what we're trying to do, particularly in, in the initial clinical setting, is we're trying to rule out um, important diseases. So you know that's obviously not very reassuring um, from a historical standpoint. If you go down and you look at the, the sensitivity of something like, um, say an S3 on examination, sensitivity of almost 13%, jugular venous distension, almost up near 40%, but again, really not all that impressive. So, you know, I think kind of the, the bottom line looking at this is in this limited example of acute decompensated heart, decompensated heart failure, you know, the alternative to including an ultrasound assessment in our evaluation really isn't that appealing. Um, now, if we add other things, so if we add some, some radiography and an ECG, we can get a little bit you know, a little bit better sensitivity. So interstitial edema, 31%, cephalization, 44%, um, frank pulmonary edema, sensitivity of 56%. Um, so, you know, things, things get a little bit better once we start to incorporate other tests. But again, these aren't tests that we can do at the time of seeing the patient. In most cases, an ECG you can, but a chest x-ray typically, you know, at least requires bringing the machine over a, a few more people involved and definitely more time involved. Um, if we start to send away some blood tests, certainly BNP has been something that's quite sensitive for diagnosing um, uh, decompensated heart failure or acute CHF. 
Um, obviously, this depends on the cutoff value you use, and, and there's patient-related factors. Um, but that being said, you know, this isn't necessarily a test that can be done in real time, depending on the lab. Maybe your lab doesn't offer this. Maybe it takes a day or two to get back, which obviously limits um, the utility. Um, now, again, I said that was in uh, decompensated heart failure. Um, there's been a lot of uh, JAMA articles on the rational clinical examination, which touch on several other aspects, um, including heart failure. So this is theirs looking at heart failure, and really the numbers kind of line up quite similar to what I have shown you, um, and it's really all not that impressive. Now, what authors and, and what investigators have attempted to do then over the years is say, okay, so what, what about this bedside ultrasound? You know, obviously we have different people using it, but you know, what is its utility? Can we improve our ability to diagnose these cardiovascular diseases at the bedside? Um, so there's been, like I said, a, a ton of different studies looking at this. I'm gonna kind of run through a, a few that I think are kind of useful to look at. Um, and, and to try to understand what we're seeing. So this is a study of um, 122 medical trainees, so medical students and medical residents, who were asked to assess patients um, uh, in order to evaluate them for cardiovascular disease. So when they were asked to just do their standard physical examination and take a clinical history, their sensitivity for determining a patient had severe, moderate severe LV dysfunction was about 26% with a specificity of about 85%. Um, and then any moderate or severe valvular abnormality, about 46%, though they were quite specific, okay? Which I think fits, right? You know, if you hear a screaming murmur on exam, it's unlikely that that's just a, a, an artifact and, and you've made it up. You know, most of the time if you hear that, you're pretty confident that there's something there. But really what I think is most telling is whether or not we, we have sensitivity in picking up these things. Now, they gave these students about between 10 and 15 hours of training um, using a handheld at ultrasound. Um, to look at basic cardiovascular um, parameters. And when they then, after their physical examination, wrote down their findings, and then they were given the handheld ultrasound to apply to the patient, they were able to increase their sensitivity, remember, from about 46% to 74% for diagnosing LV dysfunction. Um, severe valvular regurgitation went up to 70%, um, and valvular stenosis up to almost 86%. So obviously, even with limited training, medical um, trainees were able to significantly improve their ability to kind of pick up these, these clinical findings. Now, when they kind of plotted this out to get a sense of, you know, what's the incremental benefit of adding things to the clinical evaluation, you can kind of see pretty much what you'd expect, but obviously it's important to, to kind of show this with data, but with every piece of information that you add to the clinical assessment, you really do uh, increase your diagnostic accuracy, and there's a huge change once you add the ultrasound into that assessment. Now, this is a, um, uh, another study where they looked at um, internal medicine residents, and they wanted to um, evaluate how adding bedside ultrasound into the clinic will affect their, their management, okay? And basically what they did is they, again, gave kind of limited training to these, um, to these medical residents. They asked them to come up with a clinical plan, and then after they had submitted their clinical plan, they were asked to perform a focused cardiac ultrasound, and then they determined, you know, did their plan change? Did it reinforce their plan? Did they order more tests? Did their diagnosis change? Um, those sorts of things. And what they really found was that um, there was uh, obviously significant improvement again in the sensitivity for picking up things like um, left ventricular dysfunction and uh, valvular heart disease. And it actually led to um, quite a, a large improvement in, in diagnostic accuracy. They had the, the patients evaluated with formal echocardiography afterwards, and they found that once the students used the, the focused cardiac ultrasound, they actually picked up about 94% of the cardiac pathologies that these patients had that were picked up on um, standard echocardiography. And um, diagnostic, you know, picking up images that were felt by the cardiologist to be diagnostic quality images was over 
Um, now as we kind of um, move on, this is a, um, another study where they looked at um, comparing a clinical assessment performed by a cardiologist to a clinical assessment supplemented by a focus examination performed by a medical student. Um, and really the idea was, okay, fine, you know, maybe this is useful, but it's only useful, you know, maybe the argument goes, it's only useful in people that really don't know what they're doing in terms of physical examination, but somebody that's really qualified to perform a proper cardiac evaluation will be able to get, you know, better results. But again, what we see, and I, you know, I think it's probably pretty obvious, but what we see is that, you know, your sensitivity for picking up valvular lesions goes from about 50% to 89% when you compare a cardiologist, you know, just doing their clinical assessment to uh, a student doing a clinical assessment plus uh, a focused cardiac ultrasound. And they looked at a range of other, um, uh, other pathology as well, and, and for the most part, there was um, not always statistically significant improvement, but there was numerical improvement um, even with these students performing the examinations. Um, so, you know, I, I think that kind of gives credence to the fact that it's obviously useful um, technology. Now, this is another um, study where they looked at, okay, well, you know, will adding a focus assessment help a cardiologist in clinic change their, you know, management plan, their strategy? So they essentially looked at uh, around 400 consecutive consultations um, in cardiology clinic performed by board certified cardiologists. And they, again, got them to perform their assessment, come up with a clinical plan, come up with a management plan, and then after that was all said and done, they handed them the ultrasound, and then they looked to see, you know, did their diagnosis change? And they actually found out that in around 75% of the time, the addition of the ultrasound actually added something to the clinical, um, clinical impression. And it was only, it was less than 20% of the time that the cardiologist felt that there was no added benefit to performing that um, examination. Now, obviously, you know, this is a small sample uh, of studies and the, the populations, the clinical settings are extremely varied. So it's, it's sometimes difficult to try to interpret, you know, how does this apply in every clinical situation and can this be generalized to, to everybody? Um, which makes it a bit challenging, you know. So that was kind of the question that we wanted to answer by looking back at some of these studies. And, and really, the two questions we wanted to focus on were, what is the overall diagnostic accuracy of focused cardiac ultrasound when we compare it to the reference standard, which, you know, is transthoracic echocardiogram? Um, and how does this compare to bedside clinical assessment? So we. We, uh, we performed a diagnostic test accuracy um, meta-analysis and systematic review, which we um, published last summer, um, to try to get at, get at these questions. Now, just very briefly, statistics is not kind of my forte necessarily, but I think just to understand, you know, how we perform this analysis and, and how we came up with the results, I think it's important to understand how a diagnostic test accuracy meta-analysis differs from your standard interventional um, meta-analysis. And really, the bottom line becomes that, as we all know, tests are imperfect, right? Tests have errors. And the way that we kind of quantify those errors is we look at sensitivity and specificity. But the problem becomes when you're trying to summarize multiple studies across different populations that if we use different thresholds to assess what is a positive test, so for example, you know, in one study if they called LV dysfunction less than 50% LVEF, and in another study they used LVEF of 45%, how do we compare these two studies? Because when the sensitivity of a test changes, so too does the specificity. So we really need to kind of account for both of these um, parameters. So what we do is we take this information, we apply some modeling, and really we try to come up with a summary result that gives us uh, an idea of what the average sensitivity and specificity can be from these tests. Um, and uh, again, this just kind of quickly illustrates what, I'm, what I was trying to um, explain, that as we change the threshold of what we consider a positive test, you're going to change your sensitivity and specificity. And the way that we represent this then is using these ROC curves. 
Um, and the idea behind these is that if we have multiple studies that use different positivity thresholds, we can display this information that we gain from these studies on an ROC curve that kind of plots sensitivity and specificity so that we can have an idea of what the sensitivity and specificity of the test would be at varying positivity thresholds. All right, so in our analysis, basically we came up with two clinical index tests. So there was clinical assessment, and then there was clinical assessment supplemented with focused cardiac ultrasound. We only included studies that um, use transthoracic echo as the reference standard. Um, and the lesions of interest, you know, again, you can't just look at cardiac ultrasound as, as one entity. You really need to look deep into, you know, all of the specific things we look at with cardiac ultrasound. So what we wanted to focus on kind of were the big ticket items, or at least what we considered the big ticket items, which were LV dysfunction, left-sided valvular pathology, and then pericardial effusions. And really, we weren't really too interested in the specific population or the clinical setting, as long as it was a, a patient that was felt to require cardiovascular assessment. So with the help of our librarian, we ended up searching the literature. We found around 5,500 studies once we screened out the duplicates, and we ultimately whittled this down to about 18 studies that actually met the inclusion criteria. Unfortunately, in nine of those studies, we weren't able to gather all the information required to calculate sensitivities and specificities, um, and we weren't really able to get that information from the study authors. So we ended up with nine studies that we included in our analysis. Um, we performed a methodological quality assessment of all of the individual studies using this Quadis 2 tool. And this is really a tool where you look at the risk of bias and um, whether or not there are applicability concerns. Um, and you kind of compare the different studies. So, you know, obviously one concern in our study is when you look at the nine studies that were included, there's really only one study that had, was considered low risk of bias and, and applicability. Um, in every single um, field. So here is kind of the, the end result of that is we end up with these forest plots, which I know are kind of busy and a little bit confusing to understand. But, you know, the, the purpose of the forest plots is really just to give us a, a kind of qualitative assessment and, and to try to understand trends. Because remember, there's different positivity thresholds uh, uh, within these studies, so it's hard to compare them directly. But when we modeled it using a random, uh, or sorry, a random bivariate effects model, um, we're able to establish these ROC curves, and we're actually able to uh, determine point estimates, summary point estimates for the studies that used common thresholds. And what you can see, so in, in this ROC curve for, for focus compared to clinical assessment um, in evaluating left ventricular dysfunction, you can see that, you know, again, like the studies I, I showed you would suggest, the sensitivity of adding ultrasound um, to your assessment, the sensitivity significantly improves, and it improves from about 50% um, to about 85% um, across the studies. Now, and, and we did look at it, um, we did compare experts to trainees, and we found that, you know, expert users, which were considered people that had formal training in echocardiography, um, they did have better results than the trainees, but when you look head to head, you know, a trainee on their clinical exam adding focus, uh, expert on their clinical exam adding focus, they both have, have a benefit from that. Um, when we look at left-sided heart disease, so mitral and aortic valvular pathology, here are the forest plots, again, quite busy and, and uh, probably not worth talking in too much detail on right now, but this is, uh, again, the, the ROC curve that we end up plotting for the summary statistics. So uh, this, I think, again, speaks to what we, what we saw in the earlier studies, and, and I think probably what you would assume clinically. You know, the sensitivity of diagnosing valvular pathology when you add bedside ultrasound certainly Im improves. It improves significantly. But that being said, you know, we don't really see much of a difference in the sense or sorry, in the specificity. And again, you know, I think that makes sense, right? If you hear a loud aortic stenosis murmur, you probably don't need an ultrasound to tell you that that's true. You're pretty specific with that, um, with that finding. 
um, when we break it up per individual valve lesion, we can see that the biggest bang for your buck really comes in looking at mitral valvular disease as, as that's where the, the curves kind of separate the most and, and you don't see any overlap of the, of the confidence intervals. Um, aortic stenosis, you know, which I think is probably the easiest murmur to identify is, is um, probably the least beneficial um, when you add a focus to that assessment. Now, okay, so how do we, you know, if, if you'll buy the fact that, you know, this obviously improves things, okay, so then how do we incorporate this into clinical practice? You know, there's been a, a, a lot of work done at the medical school level. This is something that's being incorporated into medical school curriculum and has been for, for years now. I'm not exactly sure what they do at the University of Ottawa, but I know kind of across the United States, they've been adding focus curriculums to both medical school training, internal medicine, residency training. Obviously, the emergency physicians have been doing it for quite some time. But there's not really a lot of great algorithms that kind of explain you know, how you should use this and when you should use this. Now, this is as of yet unpublished um, algorithm, but it's a pragmatic algorithm that we kind of think is, is quite useful. I'm not gonna kind of bang on about this for, for very long, but you know, I think taking a clinical approach and trying to use the focus assessment much like you would use a targeted physical examination and, and targeted history um, to kind of supplement the information you already have to rule out specific diagnoses um, or, or rule out specific differential diagnoses are important. But this should be coming out in a chest review, hopefully in the summer. Um, so then, okay, where do we go from here? What's next, right? Um, so there's actually uh, a lot of developments continuing in the area of bedside ultrasound, and I just wanted to quickly talk about a couple of them because these are the ones that I think are kind of the most unique. So this is a, a device, some of you may have had a chance to, to play with it a little bit. It's not available for commercial sale in Canada yet, but it is in the United States. Um, it's called the Butterfly IQ, and the reason that this technology is, is quite impressive and, and perhaps a, a game changer is the fact that instead of requiring a piezoelectric crystal, which is basically the backbone of how we transform ultrasound waves into digital signals, they've basically created this proprietary silicone-based chip that kind of takes over that function. Now this is important for a few reasons. So it's important because it allows them to digitally change um, the imaging acquisition capabilities of the transducer. So they say you can use a single probe to evaluate cardiac, abdominal, lower GI, vasculature um, by changing the, the software. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is that it decreases the manufacturing cost of these devices uh, by upwards of 80%. So these devices are, are on sale in the United States for less than $2,000 a, a piece right now. Um, so they call it a full stack imaging solution and they have the capability of uploading the information once you take scans to the cloud or to your PAC system in your hospital. So you know, if you, yeah, I, you know, you can imagine applications where the on-call cardiology resident has a question about an aortic dissection or something and they take some pictures and the echocardiographer could be at home and seeing them on their computer and, and try to help out without having to come into the hospital necessarily. Um, and then the last device I, I wanted to talk about, this device actually isn't out yet, but it's expected to get FDA approval in the coming days, hopefully. Um, it's a company based out of Seattle that's created uh, a new device which they say basically combines the features of an ECG, um, audio auscultation, and ultrasound capabilities. Um, it actually has this little tag which you'll kind of appreciate on the back. So that actually allows you to connect the ECG cables to the device. So with this, they have an artificial intelligence um, software system that allows you to um, obtain ejection fraction, and because we have an ECG and a heart rate, you can obtain cardiac output. Um, and the artificial intelligence um, uh, software system is actually quite impressive. Um, the rep was here demonstrating the devices for us a few weeks ago, and you know, the device will tell you, you know, if you say, I want to get an ejection fraction, the device will say, okay, put it in a four-chamber view. And then it won't record any images until it's, the device is satisfied that you're truly in a four-chamber view. And if you're in a five-chamber view, it'll say, you're pointed too anteriorly. You need to tilt more posteriorly. 
And then once the device is satisfied, you've obtained the proper images, then it'll say, okay, I can start recording. It'll record a couple beats prospectively. Then I'll say, all right, time for a two chamber view. And it'll go through the same process. And then at the end of that, it basically uses endocardial border recognition and it'll pump out an ejection fraction, a cardiac output. So obviously, you know, the, the possibilities of this are, are quite exciting. Um, and it, uh, the clinical applications in particular, you know, um, in the emergency department, in, in the office when you're seeing a patient that's post-STEMI and really you're ordering a formal echocardiogram, but maybe all you're really concerned about is has the EF improved from a month ago when they had their MI? You know, obviously this might be able to cut down on a lot of studies for patients. Um, they also will be uh, incorporating CW and PW into it, and apparently they're working on different algorithms that are going to allow us to assess aortic stenosis and, and capture gradients across the valve. They've incorporated educational tools so they can actually label all of the anatomy. Um, and again, it's pretty cool when the rep was showing us the device, you know, if you're in a, uh, we'll call it a Mayo Clinic four-chamber view, it'll actually like shift what, where the RV and the LV is. It'll, it'll basically tell you, nope, <laughs> that's the RV, that's the LV, you gotta spin the device if you want a standard view. Um, so it's, it's quite Im impressive. So, you know, we always have kind of had this kind of mantra, right? But, you know, that might actually not be true with some of the artificial intelligence that we're gonna be seeing in, in the years to come. Um, but really, this is the way I kind of see it nowadays, you know, and, and I think for the most part, this is the way that the, the cardiology residents kind of see things, you know. The ultrasound really is that fifth pillar of the clinical examination, and it's something that we kind of incorporate into our assessment on a daily basis, and I think that's gonna continue. Um, I'm happy to take some questions, though. Thank you.